Howdy, and welcome to another folding session. I shall be your host. I am Kami Kirai. I am just a person, just a man. But today we're going to be folding something which I have been thinking about for a long time and I hadn't yet put into a tessellation, but it works remarkably well. And we're going to use a root 3 ragtime. I don't know if this exists. I mean, I don't know if this is in anybody else's name, anybody else's repertoire. I have no idea. I just. I just sort of like designed it, I did it from the ground up, so I don't know if that gives me credit or if somebody like got ahead of me, but if anybody knows if this has been done before, it just, it's simple design, so it might have been done before, so you can use any rectangle of paper, as long as it's a rectangle, this will work, and we fold our paper in half, this could be an A4, you know, it's, it's letter size for me because I'm in Mexico, and the Americans have made us use their paper. Alas, they did not get the, system, the metric system at least, at least we got the metric system. And we don't use inches, thank God. Ah, but now I'm kidding. So we start by folding the corner onto that middle line, like so. And just make sure that it's spiky, make sure that it's on the line. And then I'm gonna turn the paper over I'm going to use the shadow that I have here, it can be a reference, or I can use the edge itself, like so. It is Wednesday, I think it's May, May the 6th, 2020. It is 1.30 p.m. It's sunny, it's nice, we had a lot of rain yesterday, so today there's a lot of wind. And once we have these fold, this fold in, we're going to have this line where it hits. So we're going to cut everything away. Everything that's after that is going to go away. So I'm just going to fold like this. There are no easy solutions, but there are easy steps that will get to a complicated solution, and this is somewhat to that effect. So I'm going to co course correct some of the things I did before when I constructed it. I did this on a live stream, I did this on a Zoom class. We didn't get too much too far into it, but we did use something that I wouldn't use now. So we're going to cut this away, just making sure that we're on the line there. Pulling it down with my hand like so, ripping, ripping, ripping. Easy does it. And yeah, there you go. Now we have the root three over two to one rectangle, right? This would be root three over two, and this would be one. Might we can see the equilateral triangle there. Okay, so now what we need to do, I'm just going to show you the, the motif we're working with. So this is why I think it's so simple and so nice. It's hard to crunch it once you got the lines in, but this will also perhaps serve as a guide for further designs. So this is what caught my eye. When I folded the, these other lines in as well, I noticed that if you fold it like this, so I fold it. Well, yeah, of course, the first thing that's going to pop out at you is like, oh my goodness, this is two hexagons, right? There's like two halves of the hexagon. It's like a full hexagon, but it's, it's half of it. And they're tied up at the back. But if you sort of, you know, pay close attention to it and you open it up, that's my reference. Make sure you get a spinning one. If you open it up, you'll see that it lands exactly on the ground. These lines can right, line up perfectly. And we can see that seeking structure, all the lines are touching the ground. And so this is a very, very nice sort of, it's very interesting because we have two phenomena happening. Everything is touching the ground. Well, if it wasn't for the fold, sort of like lifting this up, it would touch the ground. And we have that the when it does, this line also touches. So this is a very interesting. So I thought like, well, how can we make it multiply? The easy way of multiplying is if we, if we fold it another, we can then just put it here. You know what I mean? Just put it here. So this cross would be here. But what if, instead of getting several papers involved, we just do it with one single paper. So I'm gonna use this division. So first off, I'm gonna get my thirds in. So the 
example I did before in the class, we did it with, um, with halves, but now this point right here is a third from that line downwards. So one third, and then we're gonna do the fold that goes to that point, and the bottom of it will be a third. So these two have to be equivalent. So if I just fold that one, then I can fold the other one onto the half, that's one way, or I could turn it over so that it's easier to see and there's no overlap. Because there are certain things that are good to keep in mind, and one of them is paper is a 3D, three-dimensional object. Although that it is flat, it is actually in three dimensions, and it does have height. Again, this thing is really nice. It's an exacto knife. I'm using a ruler for the bottom reference. But... So you see, one, two, three. Now we do the same one, two, three, and this is going to help us sort of like tile the, these columns where, go, where we're going to arrange these sets of hexagons, right? These half hexagons, we're gonna arrange them within these columns. So as we can see, for every two columns, right, we have one motif. So for every two lines, we're gonna have one motif, same thing, but now we're, they're gonna be gliding. They're gonna be a little bit separating. I don't know if that's called a, a mirror glide. There is a name for the sort of thing that's happening to these shapes, like the sort of symmetry. This thing is not the best idea. You see, these, these are the moments you realize that sometimes you're not gonna get what you want. And you're not gonna get what you deserve either. You're just gonna get something and that's it. That's saying nothing, is it? All right, so just to be clear, we have the line that goes in and then the line that goes out So to make the motif. So I'm just gonna keep the motif here lined up to my to my edges so the bottom this bottom motif is going to be lined up like this right, I'm just I'm very I'm a very impatient folder I'm not one for pre-creasing too much and when I'm pre-creasing or whatever I always turn to one fold and sort of like look at it because you never know right because we're looking for patterns so you never know when the next one's going to hit so this sequence we're just going to keep this going on, on these two So it's this angle, which we lined up to there. I think now that I'm doing it on the thirds, it is easier than doing it on the halves. So on the halves, I don't know, sometimes it seems a little weird. Like it's very natural, but it's it's not as, I don't know how to explain it. You know, like thirds and six, that's, that's, you know, that sounds even, that even sounds like it sort of relates to itself, right? I'm telling you that exacto knife, man. Yeah, I get something else. So first part of the motif is done, and now it comes the next part, which is gonna have pretty much is gonna be a good idea just to complete this sequence instead of me just going on about how we I'm not gonna pre-crease or whatever, just let's do it. So we see the distances are the same, so now this one's gonna be half. You can sort of tell, right? You, you can really just tell. So I'm, I've always preferred to fold onto the the shorter one. So for instance, if I were to fold this one down, it's harder to see what's happening. Even though this line is, is there, I find that it's easier to sort of like get the underdog in rather than put the mountain on top, you know what I'm saying? But again, like these, these are just like aesthetic things. It's just my, my style, my voice is the way I do it, but everybody has their own little voice, their own little way of doing it. Not a little voice, but everyone has a voice. And in folding, as in music, it is the same thing. I wish I could have gotten into music, man. I still can, but uh, I got so much work, so much things to do that I want to do with folding that I, I don't know, I can't find the time. I'm more into watching things. I like stories. I really, really, really like stories. And I like to think that music is the higher art form. Like, the, everything else sort of, like, can be comparable to music, but not, um, how would you say that? Not everything is comparable to everything else, but all art looks like music, but not, yeah, but not like painting, you know, like there's, there are several things that look like painting or are like painting, but not everything. It's sort of like, I think that all art sort of is like music. Maybe that's a bias of me, but okay. 
So I got my motif. So I need now the vinyl here that just to you really accentuate the, these guys. So I'm gonna fold this down. I'm gonna keep that going as well. So the guys get accentuated evenly across these cups. So the next guy would be here. So as we can see, we're folding more of the rectangles we were using, right? This is the same rectangle as the full rectangle. So we could say that this pattern that we've achieved here is a sort of three by three. There's three and there's three, although these have different values. This is not the same as this, but this is the, so to say the horizontal or the horizontal and the vertical, right? But if I turn it over, of course, and it changes. So horizontal and vertical are very, are not this, the best of terms in these sorts of cases because you can just rotate and everything changes. So for our pattern to work, as we can see, it's sort of like, you know, when you're crunching it, you're going to see that it sort of like doesn't want to. So we're going to help it out. We're going to fold right between. So there where it hits, we're going to fold the line that goes right between there, right between these two. So easy way to do it, I feel, is to take the mountain that you want to do. Take two of the mountains that you want to go between. You want to go between these two mountains, right? And just sort of fold them together. Match them like so, and we're gonna invert these lines. So, this is a valley right now, so I'm gonna do the fold the other way. And you can see that it goes right between. So, what I can do now is I can do a bounce. There's several ways to do bounces, and it's my favorite thing to do. Just because of how, like if, if you dominate the bounces, you pretty much like a lot of designs open up to you. And also you can do more clean designs, so to say. But let's see if we can find some relationships. We have that one. So we're going to pretty much need to reduce the whole pattern to, to the half of it now. So if we had these with this length, now we're going to have to go all across between. So we can do that. In several ways but we're going to need a mountain so just to keep things cohesive instead of doing what i just did or did the opposite way i'm just going to look out for matching so for instance these lines will match this line will hit over there on the top and just keep that going so that goes down there this one will be half of this one having some coffee right now and I, I stopped drinking coffee for a while because I sort of like needed to stop with the, with the stimulants just just to get you know at ease but I found that the stimulants sometimes try uh, make me calmer like they have this calming effect on me which is strange but a trait of ABB so there you go and what else man i mean i don't know people are doing their own thing everybody's got their own little ways i've been watching a lot of uh, david lynch work I've, I've been watching twin peaks i started from the ground up watched the first season second season i got into the audiobook like the, the secret story of twin peaks kind of thing behind the scenes stuff not behind the scenes but like behind the story get you more of a context of what's actually happening and I don't know, man, it got dark, it got changed, and I like it, I like the things. I like that he is, the whole show is about, like, subverting expectations, subverting reality. Not actually being, you know, taken or dominated by what you think is going to happen, rather than just trying to throw curveballs at people. Keep the mystery going. And I think that the audiobook, or like, the... The Mark Frost is the writer of the audiobook. Mark, Mark Frost is the co-writer and co-creator of Twin Peaks. He also did this show that only ran a season on ABC called On the Air. I haven't seen that one. It's interesting that there is like this thing that they also like, they tried to work with ABC again, even after Twin Peaks and they got like that canceled and stuff. And they got all sorts of hiccups with the network, but I guess, you know, if they're paying, they get to play by the rules, I guess. So I started a Patreon, and I've got a proud Patreon there, and she's been a lot of help. She, she's been showing up to the classes, 
and she's been getting out of it. She has now like given back to me. Not only not only is she contributing with the money, she also is now having me participate. No, nah, she's not making me participate. She's having me. Like she organized this group for people to do Eric the Main's class, and like I, I've been wanting to do that class for a long time, and I've never, you know, it's on YouTube. It's like MIT shit, right? Look at me cursing on an origami video. What's wrong with me? This is not for kids, kids. This is adult stuff. Folding paper. But yeah, I got a sailor's mouth, I'll tell you that. But it's not, it's not a fault. Well, maybe it is, but maybe I should stop talking about it. And this is the meditation aspect of it. Just letting the thoughts sort of like come by and... It's also the the idea, right? Like we we read and we get informed and we listen to music and watch plays and sort of like devour and consume, so that it may come out of us, so that something else would which would be output. We input art, we input all these different wonderful things that other people do, and out comes whatever it is that we process. Okay, so I can stop ranting for a little moment thank god right and let's just put this into position so you see what i'm doing now is this one's gonna crunch but now on this next column the crunch is happening over here right so when we go to the next one these two are going to be identical so this one's also going to rise on this on this line right here but this one's going to fall like so so we can sort of also try to get it to crunch, like so. And then we can sort of fold this down, like so, and then kind of bring it up like that. And so, once that's sort of set in, we can sort of sculpt it. I, I call it sculpting, but it's pretty much just putting the lines where they're supposed to be. But because these lines are, they have several ways, but as you can see, all these are mountains, and the one that matters is a valley, right? We have this one that's a valley as well, which is, although it's originally a mountain, it can be changed quite easily just because of the pressure of the paper. So we go step by step. So once, you know, once we get enough crunch that it settles, if you will, then we can sort of move on to shaping the next one and put it into position, position, position. And once it's sort of in position, then we can start to crunch it for real. And we get it to crunch, put it into position, position. And so we see that when, when it's crunched, it actually curves, right? It's going to be a full hexagon. And the reason why I wanted to do it in thirds is because every segment corresponds to an edge of the collapsed hexagon, right? If I had another, it actually complete. So if we do it in thirds, we could actually get coherent rings. rings. Right, because every three there's half a ring. So if we just do half now, we can just go for like a full ring. But also what's nice is that it's lays flat. Just like our example before, all of the all the walls can touch the ground. So this is a very basic motif, right? This is a very basic like stance on it. But if we went one level further, well this is an eights, right? We can actually count the columns. We can go like um it's in the bottom here, my base. I can I can see that it's a base because it's the one that's aligned. So it's one, two, three, four, five, six, seven, eight. Do you see that? So in here it'll go one, two, three, four, five, six, seven, half and half. That's eight. So this is an eight, and this one is one, two, three. So if I cut this in half now, it'll be six. So I'm just gonna do it. I'm just gonna go ahead and do it. And I'm gonna show you with this look one crunch because you know I might as well. Oh by the way. If you look at it on this side, you can see that it looks like a water bomb, like a traditional square water bomb. It's just these gliding, interchanging, in and out. So I think this also what's nice of it is like to get it to crunch. So when we have more than six, as we have here eight, you actually as you crunch it, you actually need it need it to be, you know displaced a little bit so that it lands where you want it to land well there's so much stuff man there's so much stuff in the world like it's it almost hurts how much stuff we can't 
feel or consume or, or you know be a part of almost but not really so you get to see the thing so we're gonna go one level deeper with this one just so we get to see the full ring and you know might as well right we're here we're now you can stop the video there if you want you want to try it out i think you got the basis of it and as i was saying this is my this is a design of, of my own concussion i don't know i did it hey, hey. but if you want to you know do it and say that you know where you got it from you can do that like how, how do you own things anyway like how do you own a fold some paper like how do you do something and i mean it has to do with other people. It has to do with somebody else coining that thing to you, like the like the clovers. I think uh, what's the name of that dude? I want to say, oh no, I don't even want to butcher it. But there's this Japanese man who coined this these clovers or these Highland Gina designs on the square, and it's pretty nice. Like it's pretty neat stuff. And yeah, he's like. You know, ubiquitous. He no, not ubiquitous. He is synonymous with that with that sort of design. So, you know, I guess he owns it. So we have six now. So these are gonna be my new my new columns. So I have to split them in half as well now. So it's you know like a triangle at the half hexagon. That's where it goes. Or you know, as you can see, we're also dividing these in half. Half. And what, well, since we're going for halves, right, we could go to ninths. If we wanted to, we could go to ninths. But I think with one third is enough to make, to drive the point across. <clears throat> but see, that's the difference of folding odd number grids on a thing. Like it could be this, the odd numbers, or it could be a square tiling, but having an odd number within not only halves actually adds more dynamic feeling to it. It, 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 become, it can be much more. Can be way much more so I'm, I'm just gonna do these both ways because i know that these are gonna transform like halfway so i'm just gonna you know i think this could be te technically called a pre-crease right we're pre-creasing we're getting ready to welcome into our homes these new folds that are going to be showing up any minute now and we'll see how good i am at crunching this thing i've only had so much practice but you know I think this design is very beautiful. I think it has a lot of potential to become something else. And so we have our units, we have our squares, and now at the middle point, we also need, so we need again, this whole thing is gonna go in half. So all these lines are gonna go in half. If only there was a stop motion option for recording. Okay, so just as a side note real quick, if I had these lines divided in half as well, I could just as easily just drive to them like just this line would just fall right on it but for right now I'm just gonna use these references you see how the line falls on the back of it because these mountains are falling on themselves because it's half of that so these two match so now these and this this and this are gonna match so pop and erase it and there it goes pop, pop. I'm also gonna see that it arrives at the corner there on the bottom it actually will touch that one so also a couple things that i can keep an eye out for so this will arrive and land on that rise and this will land and arrive on this slide and so we have that one right there and the next one And the next one. And we go on and on and on and on. There is no stopping. So again, I'm just keeping an eye out for these lines. So all these now are matching. You can see that all these match. And I gotta keep an eye out because if I miss my match, it could be not a half, but something like a quarter or something else. 
So it's always a good idea to sort of get things where they need to be. So again, all these match, all these match. This line I can actually see across because it's over now. So this one, for instance, could be a little, a little more pivot there on that one. I see little hexagons start to pop out in the shapes, in the shade. So any any relationship that you can find, it's always good. So you can see now we have all this great. We have all this thing. There are many ways to do this, I insist. But we're using a rectangle. You could use a hexagon as well. Somehow it's easier to fold a hexagon into, into split. But, you know, I think it's worthwhile to use a rectangle. Somehow it it speaks more of, of the translational symmetry we could um, exploit or use in our favor. Because after all, this, these are just columns, right? So columns, you know, cause columns and rows. So although the, the polygons, the regular polygons help, so for instance, now I'm going top there, and I know it's going to be around the half. And if I sort of aim it correctly, if I aim this point there correctly, everything else will just fall into place. Because as I've stated before, and you know, it's a fucking thing, if you can set up a proper condition, if you can set up a proper relationship for your fold, there's only one fold for that. So there's only one fold that has this land in the middle line. Right? There's only one fold for that. So if I can arrange myself to land where I need to be, I can make it be exactly where it needs to. Further, if I miss, if I'm because I don't have a clear reference there, but I can sort of like get to the point that I need and then keep an eye out for the rest of them. And I don't know if you can hear, but I can hear my, my family sort of like discussing something in the background there. But see, that's the thing. That's the thing nowadays. Like every now and again, people have to have discussions because because that's life. And you know, we don't always agree, and other people just make things more interesting and more complicated. The whole thing is that we're too many, but not not enough somehow. What is too much anyway? Especially with people. Like how how can you say that there's too many people? Well, I think that the answer that the answer is itself really. So I won't. I won't drive too much on that point. I'm not a fan, I'm not a fan of a lot of things that remind me of. Oh Jesus, am I gonna sound pedantic? No, I won't even. I won't even finish that thought. Hell no. But I am a binge watcher. Apparently. And I guess that origami is just an exercise in, in seeing, just an exercise in, in using your eyes more than anything, I feel, using your eyes and your hands. Although that it has, you know, the, uh, there's several artists or several people who, for whatever reason, they can't see very well or they can't see at all. Okay, so now, advantage. I've done one side, now these lines are going to match. So this line is already there for me. This line is already there for me. Already there for me. So I can use the, the other line as a reference point. So I'm falling on this line, which I folded. So next one's gonna be here. And there's only gonna be one fold that matches those. So I can just go there and that'll fold. See how it also completes this? So for instance, I have there that's incomplete. So I can just go to that line. Make sure that it lines up to it, and down it goes. Next one. Matching up to the line, and down it goes. So it's one, it's every two. So not this one, then but this one. I match it. I don't know, the brain is a very interesting thing. I mean, if the brain is people, then the brain is an interesting thing. If the people are something else, like some soul-like entity, then that's what's interesting. But whatever it is that we are, as a relationship of all these other factors, or whatever is inside of us, it is very, very much to my interests to figure out something about it. 
Which is why I think I'm drawn so much to story, so all this is making shadows on my paper. Also what makes me think that I ramble. Whatever it is that, that has inspired me for all these thoughts and these feelings and these sort of shapes and shadows and whatever, it has to be sort of like an, an analog within. And, you know, there's a lot of, like, the relationship of God to, to man is drawn up in the sciences a lot, which I think it's hilarious that people use science to sort of debunk, to try and debunk God or whatever, because there is, like, this thing of, I think that when people discuss God, they're not discussing whether, like, you can't discuss whether something exists or not and talk about it, right? But the point is, when people discuss God, I feel that they're actually discussing the nature of God. And some people have this idea, this fairy tale idea they get fed to as children. I think only children really believe that line. Which is like God somehow is like looking out for you. Or not even just like making sure that everybody gets their their due desserts in this life. And you know, like 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 a like a punisher, like a court order justice person for your case and somehow people get frustrated when things don't go their way so when things don't go their way they just you know that that's for them proof that god doesn't exist because if god existed then they would have they would be happy they wouldn't have everything they really ever ever wanted that's such a childish fairy tale idea of god that no wonder people get disillusioned Yeah, there's more to the mystery than we can dream up in our philosophies, right? So, same same jig. So I'm going to arrange them by columns first. And go down. So I'm going to go across and down. So up, up. I won't be able to crunch it just now. I, I might crunch it a little bit, but not, not enough. It won't be enough. Going to need a little more. And I guess the reason why the COVID thing is like so, such a big thing is because nobody wants to die. Nobody wants to see their, their family die or whatever. Like, it just in a month, this thing will kill you if it gets to you. And it's not even about weakness. Like, it's, we don't even know. Like, if we knew what is the determinant for this thing to kill you or like to hurt you, we'd probably then just be like, oh, then, you know, whatever. Just those people go out and about and do your thing and. Those that have the trait that makes you vulnerable to it, then, then you know you stay home or whatever. But a lot of people won't even realize. So it's it's very interesting how the politics and all this becomes like you know a thing. Like when this started, my grandma was like, "Oh well, you can't see me anymore." Like grandma, I haven't seen anybody. Like how, where could I get it? It's like you never know. And I guess she's right. I never know. And it's, you know, I miss my grandma. I'd like to see her again, but I can't. I might kill her. It's like, damn, this is dramatic. This life is a lot of drama. I don't like drama. I do not. So here I am folding paper. Telling people that I'm going to do the things they want me to do. When they want me to do it. And I eventually do the things I need to do. If I think I do too much things on my own time. I ramble too much, I like to write, I like to talk, I like to listen. And I guess life is to be enjoyed, like that's that's a, a nice way of sort of like guiding your principles around it. So I've been sort of like researching David Lynch out of the Twin Peaks series I watch now. I'm like, well, what's up with this dude? And I, I mean, I've seen Blue Velvet and I've seen Wild at Heart. Wild, Wild at Heart is one of my favorite movies. Like it is just a fantastic piece of film. Film history, like Wild Heart is just amazing. Just amazing. Although it is kind of crazy. Also, just a lot of violence and shit. But it's amazing. Like it's really there's like there's, it's compelling, it's it's wonderful, it's romantic. It's a lot of things. And I think that that's a lot of Lynch's point a lot of the time. Like life is a lot of things. It's not just happy or sad or violent or or passive or whatever in between like it's it's sometimes it's a it's a whole bundle of things 
And so, like, coming to terms with that just makes you less of a child, I guess. And even children could use some, some truth in their life. But, I mean, what's the point of imagination? Like, the imagination can, can you know, can, can be like a double-edged sword. It can cut you. Like, if you use your imagination to fuel your fear, to fuel your insecurities, it'll do that. It'll do that with spectacular grace. Everything will be a near death. Everything will be trying to kill you. Like your imagination will play the role you want it to play. But if you're like inclined towards truth, which is very mysterious, you're more likely to use that imagination to sort of fuel how reality can be distorted, how things can play within the rules, within the confines of what's what. Of, of human nature, if you will. Even if human nature is not really a thing. Like, I believe in humanity. I don't like when people separate into genders or races. Even though there is distinct differences and characteristics that, you know, make us unique. And sometimes it is race. Sometimes it is religion that sort of, like, gives us traits. It's not something that can take away our humanity. So... A lot of the times when people sort of like go in little groups and say like, oh, this is us, you're that's us, that's them. You know, it's, it's, it's bullshit. It's funny. Like, that's what comedians do it all the time. The comedians go on the race card, the, the religion card all the time because it's funny. It's not necessarily true. True with a capital T, true. It's true with a little t. But it's not true, true. You speak the true, true, true. So you see how much of a challenge this is? Like, just to crunch it? But once you crunch it, man, like, I'm telling you, I'm telling you, it, it just works. But it's hard to get it to crunch. And, you know, let's see how patient you guys are watching me do this thing. Hearing me rant about God and art and nature of life and things. I have this friend who went to study to Paris, art, right? She did an art major in Paris. She, did, she went to all the museums, she talked to all the teachers, she did her gallery, she did her projects. She got a passing grade and she got out of Paris, right? But she was there for a couple of years. She learned French and what have you. She comes back and, you know, even though she does a great work presenting her art, she is very anti-art. She doesn't believe in art. She doesn't, she thinks it's sort of like dead or something. Like the representation of, 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 of emotional sort of drama within the piece or the painting or the brush or whatever somehow becomes technique. Like she thinks that people just want to sort of like adorn or treat or like um, value technique rather than, than depth or meaning or mastery or craft. And there is something to that. Like I think that art somehow became political somewhere in the somewhere in our history. Somehow if it's not political, it's not art. Like if it's not talking about fucking dead children, like it's like you're not talking about anything. Which is which is nonsense. But I guess a lot of people just are drawn by that decadence, that evilness. And, and, and one of the biggest tricks that that evilness will pull on an artist is making believe, or her, that you need to suffer to, in order to relate to people. I mean, you don't need to, but it does help. But you don't need to suffer. People are not meant to suffer. You don't need to suffer to understand suffering. And furthermore, suffering will make people go like, oh, you don't understand my suffering. I like I nobody knows suffering like I do. I'm the king of suffering. And that's just like narcissism. That's that's just complete delusion. Cause everybody like if there's no original sufferer. You know, like there's no nobody has a patent on suffering, like, oh no, I'm I'm the one that suffers and everybody else gets to not suffer because I'm the one, I'm the guy, hey hey, here I am. If anything, that's like the story of Jesus. Right, this guy who went up and above, like the story, right? The story. I'm not talking about whether it's true or not. I don't even like to talk about it very much. It's sort of blasphemous just to talk about it, just because every now and again somebody will go crazy. But within the story of itself, like what it tries to sort of like convey, it's pretty, pretty, pretty interesting. It's like going above and beyond the, th the threshold of suffering to sort of like come out the other side. So as you can see, what I'm doing is sort of like going on the other side. Trying to see if I can crunch it through this method. 
So if this is going up and this here is going down, so I'm trying to model it. This might be the technique. And well, within this friend that I have who studied art in Paris, I felt really good when she told me that she thought that what I did was art. I was like, you really? I, I do art? And she goes like, yeah, I think that what you do is art. I go, well, thank you, art person. Thank you for the high compliment. So I'll, I'll take it in stride. But she also was like offended that the people who were willing to buy her art just want to decorate their, their, their showrooms, like their, their little uh, spaces in their homes. I'm like, what's wrong with that? People are buying your shit, like say thank you. Like, what more do you want? Like, you want? I don't know what she wants. It's like, you're selling things like, you know, like, be happy, be grateful. That's, you can do it as a job. You can now pay rent, you can now pay food. Like, go on. And it's just like, no, 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 I am an artist. I must not make money from my art. Like, Dude, what do you think money is anyway? But yeah, I'm not, I don't know, like, I, I understand that money makes things weird, -er, but it's part of life, like, it's, it's, it's a way that people sort of relate to themselves. Like, you know, ISIS, take ISIS, for instance, like, this is in the book Homo sapiens, actually, like, this dude, I remember, I, I forget the name of the author, and I haven't read the book, I just heard a little bits from the audiobook, like, a friend read some parts to me, not to me, but like, I think we were at his house, we were playing chess, and he had the book, and he read a snippet, while he waited for his turn to play, something like that. It pretty much goes like in, in, in Iraq when ISIS was sort of like taken over, they burnt all these things that were like, you know, decadent and human nature going like sex acts deprecated on depicted on the walls and the monuments and the whatever savvies. And they found this like stockpile of American dollars somewhere, but they didn't burn the dollars. Destroyed so much history because it was supposed to be like, you know, bad or whatever. But then the american dollar represents like tyranny colonialism you know like this this way of being which is completely immoral going like against values drugs blood everything you know you name it the dollar is there it's the ultimate symbol of, the, of whatever it is they're trying to rid the world off and they instead kept it they actually treasured it and valued it and so in a way i think that the author was making the point that they're not really after cleansing the world they're really more of like pursuing an ideology and trying to get people behind it. So they, they, they latch on to things that they have no sort of like consequence within their immediate world in a way. But I don't know. It's interesting. It's interesting that people are very quick to point the finger at the past and at themselves and at other people. Like it's just very easy to point the finger and somehow the people that say the most compliments about us are always other people. Like it's easy to, for other people to sort of like go like, nah, dude, you know, you're doing great, man. You're doing, doing such a good job, dude. It's like, oh, I don't know. Am I really? And I, and I've, and I say in that mocking voice because I, I mock myself. Like, I think it's hilarious that I'm, that sometimes I'm that like sad and desperate and, and lonely. It's funny to me that I get those feelings because it, it, it's, it's hilarious. I don't know how to say it, but it's to me it's funny. Like that, that I get to go through it is funny to me. I'm not saying that it's funny for other people to go through it. I think the way when because it's like the sun, it's like the day. Like before lamps, before candles, before fire, it got night every day. It got really, really dark. So whatever it is you wanted to do, you need to do it during the day. At night it was dark. And sure our eyes sort of like get used to the dark, but it's not the same. Life is not the same. It gets dark and then it gets light. And sort of like that's how I feel. Like I get really dark sometimes and then I get really light. And I feel very glad. And that's where I think it's funny. Whatever it is I went through because I, I couldn't see the light. And then sort of like when you're in the light, you're like, oh, it was here all along sort of thing. But it's pretty soul crushing to see the people you love sort of like go through it. But if you want to read more on, on the human nature regarding those sorts of feelings, you can read on Gabor Mate. Gabor is a great physician. He's, uh, he studies addiction and ADD and such, and he has a great take on compassion and human nature. Rather because he, he identifies as an addict, 
But he doesn't do drugs. He doesn't even do caffeine. I don't think he does caffeine. But he doesn't do drugs, but he, consider, he considers himself an addict because he compulsively buys classical music. Like, he can't help but obsess over buying, and by, by going out of his house and buying classical music. And he identifies the, the behavior he goes through as a perfect analog of what a heroin ad will go through. Like, the dopamine gets released and dissipating, and he gets all excited, and then when he goes out, he gets his hit, and then it's good, but it's not as good as he thought it was going to be. And then, you know, there's, there's this moment where he goes like, oh, I shouldn't have done it, and he lies to his wife. He doesn't go broke, but he spends like an, uh, an obscene amount of money on these classical records. So, you know, naturally that's gonna, you know, bring up some questions at home, like, where were you? What is this on your credit card and whatnot? And it's like, well, I thought we talked about this. So then this guy's just like, oh God, I can't help myself. Like, I'm, I'm gonna lie, I'm gonna lie, I can't help it. I'm gonna lie because I can't handle the shame. And then he breaks down going like, oh my goodness, I can't believe I lied to you, I love you and shit. And then he's back out of the cycle and then he's like, you know, you know, like, I realized that lying was bad. I realized that what I did was bad, but I'm not going to do it again. I'm resolved. And then, you know, what do you think that happens after? He falls again. Like, it's just his cycle. He's just in it and he can control it to some extent, but it'll, it has a hold on him. You see, this works now. This works. Sort of holding it down and pushing it like so. See, this one, for instance, don't want to go. So I can sort of like get it there once the others are in oh yeah that was better i should have i'm learning I'm, I'm still learning how to crush this guy gabor also has plenty of content on youtube like that's how i came across his work a lot of his lectures are on youtube mostly for teachers like he does a lot of work with teachers of kids and i was working with kids at one point so i, I really wanted to sort of like know more about it and, and it was it was a great source of knowledge and wisdom his lectures and it really helped, like when I went over to Dallas to teach the people and the kids and whatnot, I applied some of his techniques like to myself, to other people. I'm not gonna say I did it perfect or nothing, but it was a great source, it was a great source. So because it's six, we see that it matches perfectly. Closes right there. I don't think that these cross, I don't think these cross. Do they cross? Oh, they do cross, like so. A little bit they cross. Oof, that was a tough one. And now we can extend. So we have six here. We have eight here. So if we go half, then we get 12. And we have to do the whole crunching thing again. But we're gonna leave it at that for now. Let's put this here so we can get a nice, a nice, um, yeah, thumbnail. Yeah, thank you much. Thank you very much for joining, and I'll catch you around next time. And uh, yeah, cool. It's uh, forty-eight minutes to do this. Christ, hope this, the length doesn't turn people off. Yeah, also so just so you can see, sort of thing that happens. Oh my goodness, that was my reference line. Why? How did it move? Oh, I must have moved it by folding. I should use markers. So let's try that again for the thumbnail. Yeah. All right, guys, take it easy. Catch you around next time. Yeah, thank you.